Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. If you were around for last week's long form videos, you'll know that we covered two cases suggested by our viewers in honor of us recently passing 100,000 subscribers on the channel. We said that if those videos got a good response and you all showed interest, that we'd continue on with your suggestions for at least another week. So as promised, today we'll be taking a look at two more randomly selected stories from your list of suggestions. Before we get to the video, we want to thank everyone who took the time to send great ideas our way. We're always blown away by the amount of feedback that we get from you all whenever we ask for your help or participation. Be sure to let us know in the comments below if you'd like us to do a third and final round of suggestions next week as well. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's get into part three of our 100k subscriber viewer suggested special. Be sure to look out for a link to part four in the description below. And if you haven't seen last week's part one and two videos, make sure to check those out as well. When residents of Las Cruces, New Mexico first awoke on the morning of February 10th, 1990, they had no reason to believe that it would be anything other than a normal Saturday. Despite the city's relatively large size for the state, it nonetheless had a reputation for being quiet. It was known primarily as the home of New Mexico State University, as well as a couple of nearby military testing sites that served as the city's major employer. However, at approximately 8.30 a.m. that morning, a crime would take place at a local business that would forever alter the quiet reputation of Las Cruces, one that would haunt the city for decades to come. Just half an hour before the area would be flooded with police cars and emergency service vehicles, things were off to a sleepy start for employees at Las Cruces Bowl on East Amador Avenue. Though they had already opened up at 8 a.m., the bowling alley's dusty parking lot was mostly empty, and 34-year-old manager Stephanie Senak wasn't expecting any significant foot traffic for almost an hour when the weekly junior bowling league tournament was scheduled to begin. Helping Stephanie that morning was her 12-year-old daughter, Melissa Repass, as well as Melissa's friend from school, 13-year-old Amy Hauser. The girls were getting ready to supervise the bowling alley's daycare with the assistance of another staff member who had yet to arrive. The final person there at that early hour was 33-year-old Ida Holguin, a member of the snack bar kitchen staff who was busy making the usual preparations. Despite beginning like a normal weekend morning, it didn't take long for the usual routine to be interrupted when two armed men entered through one of the bowling alley's unlocked doors. One of the men pulled a gun on Stephanie, Melissa, and Amy, while the other went into the kitchen and did the same to Ida. All four of them were soon herded into Stephanie's office and told to lie face down on the floor. The two unknown men then proceeded to go into the bowling alley's safe, taking out between $4,000 and $5,000. At the same time that the four women and girls lay terrified on the office carpet, the bowling alley's 26-year-old pin mechanic, Stephen Turan, arrived with his two young daughters, six-year-old Paula and two-and-a-half-year-old Valerie. Stephen worked the morning shift at the bowling alley on weekends and often brought his daughters along with him to work when he and his wife couldn't find a babysitter. When Stephen entered, he found the alleyway curiously deserted and decided to investigate. Soon he made his way into Stephanie's office, where he stumbled on the act of crime scene. Like the four other victims, Stephen and his two daughters were forced to get onto the ground while the two armed men continued to take cash from the safe. Though the terrified hostages prayed that all the men wanted was money, it soon became clear that they had no intention of leaving any witnesses behind. Once the men were finished with the safe, they turned their guns on all seven of their captives, shooting each of them multiple times at close range. After that, they set fire to some papers in the office in an attempt to destroy any evidence and fled the scene. Though she had been shot a staggering five times, somehow Melissa Repass remained conscious enough to find a phone and call 911. The harrowing phone call came in at approximately 8.33 a.m., during which Melissa asked for help and tried to describe what had taken place. When authorities arrived on the scene, they were met with utter chaos as they tried to establish what had happened, tended the injured victims, and put out the fire that had been started by the two assailants. At the scene, three of the seven victims were pronounced dead. Stephen Turan, Amy Hauser, and Stephen's daughter Paula. His second daughter Valerie was pronounced dead on arrival after being rushed to the hospital. Though Stephanie, Melissa, and Ida would all survive the horrifying crime, they were in critical condition and for the most part were unable to provide investigators with information about the two culprits. 
news of the horrifying crime spread quickly, drawing dozens of local residents to the scene along with an army of reporters. As the shocking details began to make their way out to the public, citizens struggled desperately to come to terms with what had happened. The chilling crime would come to be known as the Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre. Within a day of the shooting, what few leads investigators were willing to share with the public appeared in all of the papers, along with composite sketches of the two suspects. Though no one had actually heard the shooting take place, a couple of witnesses had seen two men near the bowling alley around that time. This, combined with the little information that the three surviving victims had managed to pass on to police, allowed them to create the sketches. Details about the suspects were circulated along with a few pieces of information about the kind of vehicle they could be driving. Both men were described as Hispanic. The first was roughly 25 to 30 years of age with wavy dark hair, light colored eyes, a mustache, and a light complexion. The second appeared to be about 20 years older, a little more heavy set, with thinning hair and skin that was a little bit darker. It was believed that the men had been driving a green older model utility van, truck, or some kind of pickup. Investigators announced that within an hour of the shootings they had set up roadblocks at 10 different points in and out of Las Cruces, and that any driver leaving the area had been carefully screened. A manhunt involving more than 120 officers had also been launched, with the Las Cruces Police Department receiving help from agencies such as the New Mexico State Police, the Doña Ana County Sheriff's Department, and U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. Six planes and a helicopter were also brought in to aid in the search. However, authorities were also quick to admit that the suspects could have easily bypassed their roadblocks if they had fled the area immediately after committing the crime. As investigators scrambled to get a hold of the situation, the days immediately following the massacre were filled with a massive outpouring of grief for the victims and the families. On February 13th, nearly a thousand mourners came to the Immaculate Heart of Mary Cathedral for the funeral of Amy Hauser. The 13-year-old was described by her classmates as a quiet and shy girl when she had arrived at her middle school, but said that she had since come into her own and was an outgoing and cheerful person who brought joy and happiness to others. At the service, Bishop Ricardo Ramirez described Amy as part rose and part comet, saying, quote, They are short-lived, a comet for a brief flashing moment, a rose blossoms and gives a wonderful fragrance, but only for a while. Yet the memory of those two beautiful things remain for a long time. This somber scene was repeated a day later on February 14th, when Stephen Turan and his two young daughters were also laid to rest at a funeral in the city of Bayard. Aside from working at the bowling alley, Stephen had been a member of the New Mexico Army National Guard and had recently completed a criminal justice degree at New Mexico State University. He had planned to take the entrance exam to join the Las Cruces Police Department at the end of February and had dreams of becoming a police officer. According to Stephen's wife Audrey, he was beloved by his two young daughters that had passed away with him. Paula was actually his stepdaughter and when he and Audrey had first met, he had taken in the girl as his own. The two girls loved nothing more than going with their father to work, and he took every opportunity he could to spend time with them. At the time that the news of the funerals made headlines, investigators announced that they believed the suspects were on the move and that a nationwide alert had been put out for them. They also released information about two reported sightings, one in nearby Silver City, the other in southern Utah. According to police there, two men had aroused suspicions while asking for directions, saying that they wanted to avoid Interstate 15. However, neither of these sightings amounted to anything. In the following days, police admitted they still had no idea whether the suspects were from a local area, from out of state, or even from south of the border. While the full details wouldn't be released until much later, there were several factors working against police in the early days of the investigation. For starters, the fire that the two suspects had started at the bowling alley had destroyed valuable evidence just as they intended, and even more evidence was destroyed as firefighters worked to extinguish the blaze. The area was further compromised by the chaotic scramble to save the survivors, which meant that the crime scene could not properly be preserved. Though DNA technology was around in 1990, it was still very much in its infancy, and the emphasis at the time was on the collection of fingerprints. Investigators were able to collect fingerprints, but because so many people had been in the bowling alley's office and in other places in the building, much of the evidence was rendered useless. Finally, because of the extent of their injuries, police were not able to interview any of the three survivors at length until nearly two weeks after the shootings had taken place. Even then, they could not always be as much help as they wanted to. Ida Holguin later spoke about how she had trouble recalling many of the details of the crime, especially right after it had occurred. 
She had suffered significant injuries to her head and fragments of bullets were unable to be removed from her brain. Near the end of February, Las Cruces police announced that they were reaching out to Unsolved Mysteries for further help publicizing the case. They said that they hoped the show's 30 million viewers in the U.S. and Canada would be able to help generate significant new leads in the investigation. When the segment premiered in March, hundreds of tips came in, but again, none led to the breakthrough that investigators were looking for. At the end of the year, they said more than 300 potential suspects had been questioned about the killings, but none had panned out. Based on comments made by Las Cruces Police Captain Fred Rubio, it was clear that the authorities were entertaining two different theories of the case that the suspects were random robbers who committed the crime out of opportunity, or that they had meticulously planned the crime for some other reason, and that the robbery was a secondary motive. In an article released in December of 1990, Rubio said that he believed that the killers were not complete strangers to the area, and that he didn't think it was likely that the bowling alley would be the target of random thieves like this. However, the bowling alley's owner, Ron Senak, the father and grandfather of Stephanie and Melissa, claimed to police that he had been burglarized several times in the six years that he had owned it. Around the one-year anniversary of the chilling crime, Las Cruces police once again announced that they had made little progress in their investigation. The most substantial update came from Rubio, who acknowledged unofficial theories that had started to spread about the case. Rubio said that he was aware that there were rumors that the crime had something to do with unpaid debts owned by Ron Senak, but that none of these rumors had so far proven to be true. While Rubio didn't go into detail about what prompted his speculation, it's likely that it had something to do with the sale of the bowling alley at the beginning of 1991. It was reported that Senak had driven the business more than $1.5 million into debt over the six and a half years that he'd owned it, and that he had failed to make mortgage payments in the months before the sale. Media had also earlier reported that police were considering a possible grudge against Senak as a motive in the crime. However, no information substantiating the theory was released after that. A similarly short-lived update came in July of 1991 when police announced that they had new leads about the murder weapons possibly used in the killings. The information had supposedly come following an appeal to the public and police reported that they were investigating it but could not disclose any additional details. After that, things fell silent once again. For more than two years, nothing of serious interest was released until in October of 1993, a shocking report was released by the Las Cruces Sun News. The newspaper alleged that police believed that an organized crime syndicate could be behind the bowling alley massacre, possibly one from Mexico. The report cited an unknown informant familiar with the crime syndicate, who also allegedly told police that the unknown suspects had been hidden in Las Cruces for two days before making their escape. After that, they had been driven over the border to Juarez, where one of the killers was since rumored to have been killed. Finally, the report alleged that police knew the identities of the people who had harbored the suspects and that they were close to making arrests. While investigators did acknowledge some details of the sensational story, including the idea that they had considered bringing charges against two individuals believed to have hidden the suspects, they pushed back on other details. District Attorney Greg Valdez said that evidence of the harboring had been presented to the previous DA, but that they had decided not to pursue the charges. He did not provide a reason why. He also said that he was not optimistic that the case could be solved, and that the investigators did not, in fact, know the identity or whereabouts of the suspects. Rubio added that if they knew who the killers were, they would be filing charges. As far as we can tell, the bizarre report was the last major update to take place in the Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre. In the years since, numerous articles have been released informing the public that the investigation remains active, but publicity and interest surrounding the case generally seems to peak annually around the anniversary of the crime. It seems that every time the same few details about the case are rehashed, investigators advise that they are still searching for answers. This is not to say that the story has died in the public imagination. In fact, in the last few years, many people have continued to explore the chilling case, making sure that it doesn't fade from view. On the 20th anniversary of the crime, a documentary called The Nightmare in Las Cruces was released, detailing the facts of the case and including interviews with family members of the victims. The case has also been featured on many true crime podcasts. For the survivors and members of the victims' families, however, the nightmare will never truly be over until the case has been solved. And given the fact that more than 31 years has now passed since the crimes took place, time is likely running out for justice to be served. For some, it is already too late. Sadly, Stephanie Senak passed away in 1999 due to complications from her injuries. Still, the families and survivors hold out hope. 
The family of Stephen Turan have worked hard to honor his memory by continuing to spread the word about his case and say that they're grateful to all of the people who helped keep the investigation alive. They say that they believe someone out there knows something and they hope that one day they will come forward with that information. As of last year, Crime Stoppers is offering a $30,000 reward for information that helps to identify the perpetrators behind the Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre. Anyone with such information is encouraged to reach out. It could help solve this mystery once and for all. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.